Hi, my name is Max Gagliardi, and this is a Talk Energy podcast. If you're watching this video, take a moment to hit the subscribe button on YouTube, help me out, or follow us on your favorite podcast app. And for everybody that subscribed after the last episode, you're amazing. You got me to over 100 subscribers, uh, which is great, working on that custom YouTube URL. Uh, and again, just thank you so much. We'll see how long it takes. Now we're on the march to 1,000. Uh, so hopefully we can get there here. It'd be great this year, but uh, maybe that's ambitious. So, uh, But again, thank you guys so much. This episode's guest, again, is my dad. This is part two with Frank Gagliardi. In the last episode, we talked about his career. In this episode, we finished that conversation. Then we talked just about the current state of the industry and market uh, and just other random discussions between him and I. So hope you enjoyed the show. You got down with Chesapeake. What year did you retire? Was that last 2019 or, 2000, or 2020? It was 2019. 19. 19. So you've technically been semi-retired now for how many years? A year and... Almost two years. Almost two years? Almost two years. But, you know, let me, I did t- talk about one phase of my career. Okay. Just real fast. Yeah, your independent Yeah, times? my independent phase. And so I, 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 I had a partner at Williford. Kevin Creedon was a land man. And when Williford laid us off, I Kevin came into my office. I said, Kevin, it's not that hard. We could do this. And he said, I already have been. Yeah. And he had been an operator. And so we were partners and we went and bought natural gas clearinghouse. We'd bought it live auctions, interest in wells. Sure. And he was lending me money. And so here I was, kind of like your situation. I'm not working. I'm working. I, I'm, but I was. But this is when you were. I was working, but I wasn't being paid. Right. You mean like my early situation? Yes. And so, uh, and we were buying properties, and we we're trying to project what the price is going to be. Because when you're at the auction, you, you don't want to pay too much for something, yeah. but you want to have some upside. Right. Well, but gas was about buck sixty, buck eighty. Yeah. And which oil, is like oil was about at this point it dipped again. 15, 13. And so we didn't get real aggressive. Well, most of the stuff we bought were two and three year payouts because three, four years later, prices turned around, certainly natural gas. Right. And some of those interests and then the overrides that I had from Hawkins and over the years, even to this day, I have interest, royalty interest and working interest, unfortunately, in Wells. And so I got to be an operator. I got to be uh, a working interest owner. And I love what Jim Hawkins said about a downturn and all the rigs going away. He said, if there was one rig running, yeah. I want to work an interest in that well. Yeah, yeah. And so. That's the spirit. It is the spirit if you think about it. And, and this business is always going to go up and down. And so sure. catching those cycles. But how do you know you can invest in oil and gas? And this is the litmus test. Take $1,000 go to the toilet flush it down the toilet go to sleep no drugs no alcohol yeah. just go to bed just be able to fall just, right asleep. just fall asleep knowing that will i get a return sometimes you put money down a hole and you never get it back sometimes you get great returns right and so but you can throw money down a well and can you really lose money because sometimes it happens. Sometimes you yeah. get great rewards. So the business is, uh, especially putting your own money in, it's something else. Most people work for public companies don't have that feeling of equity. The skin in the game element. Skin in the game right. in an element. So when you're a working interest owner, when that next perforation, when that next test, and you're paying for that, the decisions become a little bit more uh, determined. And uh, and there again, uh, I had that experience, so I'm glad. Yeah. So that's awesome. And I think that some of the things that you did just by being on your own and being independent, you were able to give me advice in my career. Uh, and I want to talk about career stuff and professional stuff later on. So I think you've been instrumental yeah, in helping sure. me out with that. But I think that those times uh, are harder mentally. It, it, it pushes you mentally in a place that you don't go to when you're at a big company. When you're at a big company, there's different stressors different things you have to deal with, right? You've got bosses that are difficult. You've got positions that you politics. want to do the politics, right? The, it, that's the word for it. But when you're on your own, there's a different set of stressors. It's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of having to hustle. You can have big rewards, but you can also have um, a lack of anything going. You know, you can yeah. put a lot well, of effort into something and nothing the, can come out of it the, too. The hardest part of being an independent was not having that impetus of, what you said on a public company got quarterly yeah. results. Most of the stuff you're doing, I was doing was with private investors. Right. And there's no impotence. Some years they want to spend more money. Some years they don't. It was based on their 
different situations. Yeah. And so it's not like a growth engine type deal. Right. And so uh, there again, it's, uh, it, it, you know, the one thing I love about the energy industry is the wealth that we create at multiple levels. I look back on it in my career and you could have been a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, whatever you did, a teacher, lawyer. But I was someone who brought energy to people. Even yeah. better, we leased it from a royalty owner. He got royalty if it was right. successful. Now, sometimes the landowner didn't have royalties. We compensated him. Yeah. And, and, and I get it. No one wants a road where they didn't want a road and a bridge or a low water crossing. But... There's a lot of times that people were glad that we were there because we gave them money that they could do something else with in their life and, right. and, and fix their farm or fix their house. And they weren't going to get that capital anywhere else. And then the vendors through the community, the stores, the, the amount of, of commerce that goes around the business. I, I don't think people get a, a feel for that outside of the uh the industry and, and people who live along the coast. Right. Because the rural areas are the ones that really uh, thrive off of the oil and gas industry because they're in an area where they they just don't have a lot of commerce. So yeah. That was, that was the number one thing going for. One element of it that I think is really interesting that I've found personally connected with is that the this idea of the royalties and it being the minerals being in the ground and being this resource that's localized and that is tied to community and being from Oklahoma, I think one of the things that was cool for me early in the, and when I started learning about the business was this place that I'd lived my whole life and knowing that you had been in oil and gas and it was, you know, you're a kid, you don't think about these things. But as I got older and thinking about this incredible resource that was just beneath our feet and it was just from this place that I'd always lived and I, you know, and you're looking at how much of this energy is coming out of just, I mean, these resources are right here. Like, you know, so we live in this place that is providing this, uh, this good or service, right. However you want to look at it, this energy to society and some of the things that, I mean, that's just really cool. And then also just like when I first started working, I was working in Oklahoma and then learning about the state, learning about the different areas. And I remember just understand, just even like just learning the counties of Oklahoma and then seeing like this prolific resource that was coming out of it. I remember having just this new appreciation for where I'm from, my roots, uh, you know, where I grew up and the just the minerals and the resources that are here. And I just didn't have that appreciation for that. And then you look at what is done in the U.S. and on a global scale, what the U.S. has been able to do with oil and gas production. And if you look at all the products that it creates and all these things without getting too uh, moral case of fossil fuels sure. on everybody. Yeah. But there is an element to that that I thought was really powerful and that I think that a lot of people, including myself when I was younger, just didn't think about. No, I, you just don't think about it. And then when you do think about it, you're like, this is this is crazy. I mean, like we have all this resource, we're producing it right here where I'm from. And it gave me a better appreciation of my home and where I was born. And it gave me a better appreciation of just the overall value chain and what it brings to society. And so it's a pretty cool aspect of it. That's beyond the monetary or the cycles or the prices. There's just this level of it. That's kind of like, that's powerful. Right? No, I, I, I don't, I don't think most people, and we're just talking energy. I don't think most people, can fathom where their energy came from. You don't think so. About th those it. people need. Uh, it, let's take Chicago. Where's the gas come from? Chicago. Right. What basin? I know one basin it comes from because I worked it. Do you get in field of Kansas? Right. You know all that gas. It doesn't serve Kansas. It serves Chicago. Right. They're interstate lines. They were going to put interstate up, lines. Interstate, and they yeah. were going to put a pipeline in or a coal fired plant. Right. In the Ugadin field. Yeah. And I was working on it for Chesapeake and they were against it. And I said, why are you putting a coal fire plant for electricity in the Ugandan They said, all the gas goes to Chicago. Yeah. And besides, it's cheaper. Yeah. And right. so it, 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 it struck me as odd that here you are in the middle of a gas basin. The people that the gas are going to don't really get it the people in kansas are a net what greater energy per, uh, user because of agriculture right and so we, we don't respect that part of the world for what they not only provide energy but they're the breadbasket also sure and so without energy 
without that natural gas, what? We don't have wheat, we don't have corn, and we don't have gas in Chicago. Right. And that's just from someplace out in southwest Kansas, like the Panhandle. Yeah. And these are rural areas. And it's a great resource. It, it's a tr- If you think about the value that that resource creates for the country, it's tremendous. It is. And today, on and, and when the weather's... Super cold. Super. I mean, it is cold to the point to where clearly we need natural gas. Uh, And I think there was a study. I don't want to get I try to be relatively apolitical, but there was a study that came out that said X amount of people died last year from uh, air pollution. Right. And there was a high up person in the energy space. I won't name who they are, but they said, well, you know, it was like one out of eight people had complications from air pollution or something. There was some article and then someone said, well, a hundred out of a hundred people were able to survive this, you know, polar vortex and all these things because of the energy that we have. And so you just don't think about the good that it brings, right? right? It's easy to criticize anything in life. There's so much things that it's easy to say, Hey, this is negative. This is negative. You see a lot of negative, but I don't think that people focus enough on that. And I just don't think that it's almost like, it's almost like this is a weird analogy, but like kind of like when you think about uh, the solar system or space, there's these certain things that are too vast, or like the oceans, right? It's almost too vast to like comprehend. You're like, I don't even know if I can think about the Marianas Trench. It's just almost mind blowing. Right. It's kind of like the energy in- right. infrastructure. Right. Like I read something that said there's been over two hundred trillion dollars invested in energy infrastructure for oil and gas, right. and so just the vastness and the complexity of what it takes to live our lives in the, in the modern world. It's almost like you can't think about it. It's almost I mean, like these other concepts I just brought up. You're like, I don't even know if well, I want to go down that because it's just too hard for pe- normal people to think about. I'll just get to the irony here. So those Marcellus farmers in Pennsylvania get to have their gas sold. Utica. Right. Those people in New York, right across the line. There's a line somewhere never been there, you cross the state line, you see the sign on the highway, but that line extends all across the state for landowners. Yeah. On one side is New York, on one side is Pennsylvania. Right. On one side, they're allowed to develop their minerals, right. pipe it to a free market, and get this, New York doesn't even want the pipeline. Yeah. But everybody in Manhattan wants a gas range. Right. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, it's, it's a complicated issue, and it's an issue that it's like, I don't know, what the best way to affect change when it comes to the energy yeah. debate. And so this is something that I've focused a lot about, right? Which is what is effective when it comes to the narrative around energy in this show. And like I talk to people and I really want to make it a point too. So today I was on a, there's this app called the clubhouse app and we had a discussion around energy and it was titled energy, petrochemicals, oil and gas. And it was a bunch of different voices and it was international voices. We had a woman on that was an international offshore wind development, large scale wind development. You had guys that were looking at uh, mining and the different like technology around mining and lithium. You had people in oil and gas, you had people in, and these different uh, industries and from different walks of life, people vary in the renewable space, very green focused and preaching on that. People very traditional oil and gas. And so you've got this big sphere of voices and ideas around how to move things forward. And what I often struggle with is how do you affect change and how do you position yourself and your ideas in a way that are going to be the most effective in, in affecting the things that you think are important and what, I found, at least anecdotally in my career, and just recently I've thought about it a lot, given the the, the climate, no pun intended, I've said that before on the pod, but uh, so that's a joke that I'm reusing. But basically the, the thing that I've noticed is that do is it does it matter if you throw these facts and these things in people's faces and try to throw it up to them? I mean, because obviously people have emotions involved when it comes to energy. It's been politicized. Sure. And so – What's the best way to affect change? Is it to try to be in the middle and, and be sympathetic and empathetic to people's viewpoints and ideas around what, you know, the future of energy is going to look like and say and, and to spell out facts and to say, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Um, and, and kind of play in the middle. But because I felt like being, you know, I've seen a lot of things with social media and all this stuff where people get very entrenched yeah, in like their ideas right. and they want to like they want to almost throw it in your face. Yeah, it's almost like a gotcha. Sure, like, right. oh, I'm going to play gotcha. Have you heard of this fact? And they throw some fact to you. And I'm almost kind of like, is that productive? And so that's the thing I've struggled with a lot is it I want to hear all the sides because I feel like if you're kind of in the middle and you can hear all the opinions, then maybe you'll be better at affecting change because right. you can be at the table right. and have a 
centralized voice. But I don't know. It's just, it's an interesting topic to me, well, well, given everything going on. Well, when I think about energy and the the change, obviously, we the easiest molecule to move out of the ground is is gas, I mean, and we're great at it. We we, we find a lot of natural gas, right. and and we can do it. And it's relatively clean. And, and, and there again, I'm I'm not even going to get into the physics of natural gas versus unleaded gasoline that we used to burn and 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 diesel. And so we've gotten better over time. And I think emissions countries that have energy are better at not polluting. It right. just is. I was in Manila and they were still burning bunker fuel. And if you go into the rural areas and they're just burning whatever they can. Right. And so uh, and, and there again, a lot of part of the world is rural. And yeah. A lot. I mean, there's a it lot is. of people and without so we, energy. And we all know what the, the world looks like at night with the lights on and off. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that don't have electricity. And so when I think about energy and, and the grid that we have here in Oklahoma and how we're able to switch during peak times to a gas fired versus coal fired because you have peak demand. Everybody comes home five o'clock, cooks kind of, dinner. It's pretty powerful. It right? is. It's, it, it's, a, it's a multi-state system that feeds off of each other. And, and, and energy is kind of cheaper, really, on a, a per yeah. capita basis over time you know it's deflationary because yeah, of technology it, 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 in some ways which is amazing i mean the fact that i got four dollars at mcf in 1982 uh, on a well was after gas was deregulated it just so happens i hit a, a good period where we got four bucks an m and uh but you can't like we said we can't predict price but just getting back to what energy does for us wow how powerful yeah and now i, I i'm all for transitioning but I mean, if you really think about long term humanity, you have to think about it. But but in reality is what we don't recognize is all the ways we use it. Yeah. So who doesn't want an asphalt parking lot? Right. You want to step out and just dirt grass. Anytime yeah. you change a, 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 a surface, even if it's concrete, you change runoff. Yeah. But, right. you know, there's products that we use in asphalt is obviously is petroleum based. Yeah. There's a lot of asphalt. Everything is like petroleum based. Yeah, I get it. Nail polish, nylon, you know, it's it's the whole gamut. And so all those kayaks, when then the rig was going up to Alaska and all those kayaks got around it, they were yeah. all plastic kayaks. Go figure. Not one wooden kayak. But in reality, we're not the demon. <laughs> we're the people that's given prosperity because you can irrigate, you can grow, and that's why we're the best, and that's why some countries struggle because they don't have the energy. But that's why people feel so upset whenever they're called the demon. That's why people get upset is because they can they know the good. I haven't seen it yet, so I don't want to misquote it. But Joe Rogan had Elon Musk on uh, yesterday or the day before, and there was a quote I saw today on LinkedIn. And I don't again, I don't want to misquote it because I haven't watched the episode. But Elon admitted he goes, "Look, you know, this oil and gas is going to be around for a long time," and he goes, "These people that have spent their whole lives providing." the service and product uh that embedders all of us he's like maybe we shouldn't uh demonize those people yeah, he's like I that's mean, not a bad that's probably not a productive now and again i'm paraphrasing yeah, it, but, it but basically that i, mean, I, don't, I don't i don't see that as a productive no narrative. I, I don't i don't look at the whalers as brutal people right they killed whales for lamp oil right to have people have light yeah, they they it was it was crude. It, it was not the right thing, yeah, but they had no nah. alternative. Right, and at the time that was the, you're not like these people are bad people because they were whalers. Right, they were they were caught up in a commerce at the time. Yeah, not good. Yeah, change. Right, found something else. So, like, if you look at change, and I've read a book recently called Powering the Future. It's a little dated. It was like 2012, 2013. He's a uh, Stanford or I can't remember. I could be quoting this wrong, but it's a professor and he, and he wrote this book and he kind of goes through almost like a game theory of what the all, you know, logical path would be. And, he, and it ends at nuclear. That's the spoiler for the book, but it's interesting because he kind of talks about each energy source. He talks about the limitations and really, I mean, hydrocarbons, like realistically, it's not, I mean, it, if you think humanity can go on for millennia, it's not forever. I mean, you can't, I mean, we're growing. There's a lot it's of a people. Finite, it's, a it's a finite, finite resource, right? I mean, so beyond whether you believe like, oh, I love oil and gas because I grew up around it and it's the thing that I've made my career around. Like, that's great. But in a thousand years from now, if you believe humanity, because we've been around for thousands of years, if you believe in a thousand years from now, we're growing it. I mean, I think I looked at like the 1918 uh, Spanish flu, and this is topical because of COVID. And there was a 1.5 billion people on the planet. 
today there's seven ish, seven and a half. I don't know the, the real number, seven and a half. So in a hundred years, uh, that's a lot of growth in people. And if you think about where we're going, some people will argue that it'll plateau and humanity won't, you will quit, you know, growing at the pace we're growing at. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. But, uh, but the point is, is that it's a finite resource. We're moving into the future. So I don't think it's non-productive. I think it's productive to think about the transition of energy. And I don't know that I think it, what I think is non-productive is when it's these narratives that are not realistic, right? Like gasoline cars are going to be gone in 10 years. It's like, no, they're not. Okay. So, I mean, so I, again, it gets back to this kind of middle ground around how do you be productive when you talk about these things? Because I think they're important things to talk sure. about. Because if you really care about humanity, and, and sure. I, if I care well, about I mean, my three sons and their grandkids, right? What energy source are they going to use? Maybe it's hydrocarbons. It probably will be a large sure. part hydrocarbons. But then their grandkids. I mean, that seems hard to people to comprehend, but it's not that far into the future. And so what happens? Uh, I, I guess my point is, is that I think it's productive to invest in these technologies and look at what's next. Uh -huh. But do it in a way that is actually productive and not politicized well I, I think what happens is is we want a transition we want something better but in reality to get there yeah it, it, it it's not effective in the sense of just doing away with like a pipeline like right you know, there again, or, or stop drilling on federal land. Yeah, yeah. those things, and and as that's that's those are political things, right? But in reality, if, if you're talking about climate, geologists, and I'm a geologist, when I talk about climate, oh my gosh, I think eons. I think, in fact, yeah, you're I saw, thinking about. In life. fact, we put a time scale out there, and it's, and it's been on LinkedIn. There's several time scales, and what they don't show you is how skewed. The time scales are because we so show skewed. it's we show from the Cambrian on and all these we want to show where life is and all that but what we don't realize is that the majority of the time on Earth was just this molten uh, planet that was just cooling off and it was it was just uh, granites and 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 so that was a large part of Earth's history yeah and today we're coming out of an ice age right. What happens? So people don't think about an ice age. What what did it do? Can you look at the land and figure out where it was? In Pennsylvania, it's Moraine State Park. Sure. It's the end of the glacier. And so as you go north, yeah. everything's changed. So what happens is you're coming out of this ice age. The Great Lakes weren't even there. Yeah. They just that's just like a recent geological thing. Sure. And so sea levels rising. Why? Right. Because we're coming out of an ice age. Right. But like but beyond the like causation and effect, like correlation and causation around you know, like look, there's a lot of sensationalist headlines right around sea levels are rising, no, ice caps are melting. Let's just like put that stuff to the side and put I, it in a category of okay, this I, got a lot of clicks, right? But let's just focus on because I mean to your point around geological time scales, it is it gets back to what we talked about. Things that are hard to wrap your head around, it, it's hard to wrap your head around. Well, but here's the thing is that those I talk, types of time scales. I get it. But I talked to a professor at the University of Miami. I was in a field trip in the Turks and Caicos. So we talk about sea level rise. It's the rate of sea level rise. Sure. And that's a big argument is it's the rate, rate of change. It's, it's the rate of change. And so his argument was we've never seen this rate of change before. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I get that. That's I, get that. Right. I get that. I get that. I get that. So I mean, so beyond like the – because, I mean, I think here's the thing that I've come to the realize, realization of is that climate – and historical climate, geological climate is hard because we only have rocks to look at and cores. And future climate is hard because we only have models. But I think what everybody agrees on is that uh, humans have an impact, right? I mean, we're here. Sure. We're here. There's right. six, seven billion of us or six billion or whatever it is. I'm no misquoting doubt. the number. There's a lot of us. And we are here and we're going to keep having babies. And so, and we want to all be alive. So what do we do uh, to be, I think sustainable is a good word. I hate like some of the words, the terminology is good. Sustainable is a good word because it means right. how do we sustain what we have right now, which is a good thing. We've right. got a good thing going with this planet. Sure. And part of me worries that there is a uh, like, 
I don't want to say like narcissistic view that we can control everything. There's elements of this planet, like you mentioned with geological time, that's just kind of well, like, I mean, we're just along for the ride. But at the same time, we're having an impact. Sure. And so how does energy evolve? And I, we're not going to answer it on this podcast, but I think what I'm more focused on is like, what's the productive narrative right. to getting the right, right decisions made that aren't just like canceling a pipeline or like, uh, or just like blindly backing fossil fuels. It's right. like, let's make smart decisions. I think it comes down to technology is what I've been really interested in lately. Like, how do we look at technology and think about, you know, when I was uh, a kid or, you know, when we were younger, if you were in like the early 90s and you said the most valuable company was going to be a cell phone company, you just said, well, and you brought this point up about Tesla and the EVs. Right. It's like, well, back then cell phones weren't a dominant technology. They were a technology that wasn't superior to a landline for a lot of reasons, right? Like they, they weren't better than landlines. Landlines had connectivity. You knew someone was going to, you could get a hold of somebody, right? It was connected to the grid. And then eventually cell phones, you know, Steve Jobs invented a cell phone that was better than the landline. It had internet connectivity and you could do, you could get on there and search and do all these things, email. And so it became a better product. And so for energy, What's interesting to me, and you can lump EV in there, you can lump the renewables in there. Is it like, can we get to a place where it becomes a better product? And I think that's the, the part that I struggle with, with like electric vehicles or all these things is like, is that I don't know today that they're a better product, but, but am I like how I was in the early nineties looking at a cell phone and saying, Hey, it wasn't a better product and I'm underestimating technology and its sure. growth. And so I think that getting the narrative around one, how do we, propagate the right technologies? How do we get the smart, capable people that are in oil and gas and in these other industries that are technical and smart to, to push those technologies forward, but do it in a apolitical and productive way? And I think that's the struggle that we're facing right now, uh, which is uh, let's just make changes that are good changes, not just changes for the sake of change. Well, I, I think about cheap energy. And when I say cheap energy, I, I think about the biggest biggest raise to the middle class was low energy prices right cheaper gasoline when you, when you live far from town when you drive great distances people in this country don't all live in a city so getting back to climates and in and, and i'll break climate apart because the climate is a big subject i want to break it apart a huge and, subject and, and so tell me about the air, the water. Or tell me about your climate. What part of the climate are you having a problem with? Next time someone asks you about climate, look at them and say, what part of the climate is really affecting you? I, I want to know about yeah. climate in yeah. your life. And that's a whole nother subject. But weather and climate are but, uh, different, hard to differentiate. But, and I think but, the problem is, is that people have a hard time thinking about, I'm hot today, or there's a hurricane right or now. Or there's a fire. Or Why is there Yeah, right, right. And they, they don't think about... Climate to me is geological timescales and geological timescales are people can't think about well, saving money I mean, for next month, it's, it's, let alone a uh, hundred years or a hundred million years. What's that one degree or that two degrees rise over time that we're worried about? Because it's not like right. it's not big number. It's not going to jump 20 degrees. And so we're looking at these incrementals and grain belt shift and, and things change. And, yeah, ice melts. and it, But it's always been that change. Yeah. And so when we think about the planet over time, but when it really gets down to economies, you don't crush an economy, a rural economy, by making energy higher price. It's not effective. It's not, because they're going to struggle. Now, the people in the inner cities, they have a different mode of transportation. So what people, and if you look at scale, I always like to think of scale, what right. makes L.A. and New York and Chicago, what are all viable with those systems is because of scale. Right. But the amount of energy that scale requires so much greater yeah. because they have to have all this infrastructure. So how do you do that? Where does that energy come from? I, I just want to know where is it going to come from? How are you going to generate it? How are you going to generate all the electricity for all those cars? Turns out it with. The current technology is not a lot of good options. The options are hydrocarbons are the best one today, and that's not a controversial statement. It's just a fact. And so there's these other options that can be there in the future, and let's invest in those. Sure. But let's be realistic around the path to get there right. and how we and how we do right. it. And so I think this is an interesting 
an inflection point to transition the conversation around where we're at today in oil and gas, where the market's at sure. and the pricing. You know, we've been through a downturn now. We're in a seven-ish years. It was 2014. It's right. 2021 now uh, when we first had the big dip in oil. You've seen downturns before. Sure. And then we and then we've also, in the backdrop of this downturn, which in some ways I think will have effects on the price of these commodities, is this this movement towards the energy transition, which we've <laughs> segued in right now talking about. And so you've got the and I don't know if that's ever been like that in your career. I know there's been things that have happened in your career around like, for example, in the seventies and then in the eighties with the natural gas and um uh, thinking we didn't have any and oh yeah, you always thought that would play it run out. So you right. always get to the point, well, what's next? We drilled the red fort. Oh, there's a new play. We drilled one well section. Huh, we had no idea we're gonna draw eight wells a section. Right. Right. So there's always been that point in the business right. where you thought you were out of ideas, you thought you were out of things, and then you know, necessity is the mother of invention, as right. they say. And right. so you, you come up with things. And so moving forward, when I think about hydrogen, some other alternatives, hey, sounds great. Let's make it work. Mm -hmm. But you got to make money doing it. There's there's the end of the day, whatever. Unless it's like government, unless it's like the DOE doing research. Other than that, but you got to make money. Commercialism. Commercialism, you got to make money. In full right. scale. And so my, my I think Tesla is a great story. Yeah. But in reality, when I talk about the turnover of vehicles and, and no one talks about the cash for clunkers deals, but I always want to bring it up because there was the largest turnover of vehicles ever in America. Yeah. Ever. Right. 800 and some thousand cars. Right. Even worse from an economic standpoint, we took good vehicles. We ruined them just so that someone would go get another vehicle. Right. But anyways, what did that represent? Not 1% of the fleet. Right. Not 1%. And that was the largest ever turnovers right. of vehicles. So how, realistically, people think there's 250 million cars, plus or minus, I don't know. So yeah, how does, a lot of And cars. then how often do you buy a car? How often do most people buy I think buy it's like every six or seven years. Yeah, right, bingo. Right. So For get Americans. it. And so this whole thought that we're gonna run away from that. Well, make a better mousetrap. It's like it's not a better cell phone, right? Okay. Let's get back to the analogy of sure. the cell phone. I get it's it. like it's like you're it. buying a you're right. you're you're taking a iPhone right now with our normal car that we have, and you're buying a, and a flip phone with a Tesla because Tesla Tesla's like a flip phone is it's disguised as the next thing. But if you really look at like the logistics of how far it can travel in terms of one charge, how long it takes to charge, how it works in the cold, how flexible it is, the, re the maintenance on it, the repairs, you start to factor in all these things and you're saying, well, I'm trading in my iPhone for a flip phone. I mean, like it looks like a shiny flip phone with a big touch screen on it. But at the end of the day, I don't think that they compete from a better product standpoint. And that's, until it's a better product, I have a hard time envisioning a future where that is what is uh, is the normal thing. No, I, I think you're spot on. And uh, the, the maintenance of a car, the, the ability to, OK, now someone crashed into my car and I got to drive to Dallas to get it fixed. Yeah. Well, I mean, but like in theory, that could get changed. Yeah, change. right? like that could change. Right. Like you could say, hey, we'll get it. Let's say let's get a Tesla sure. or maintenance place everywhere in the U.S. But there's still problems around batteries oh, yeah. and around uh, and around. I think I did the math the other day day and it was every tesla is it's about half of uh, half a million pounds of earth has to be moved mined right. to get a single battery so it's like two hundred fifty thousand tons so about five hundred thousand pounds of earth and you know so there's uh so i think it's like a hundred something trillion tons of earth would have to be moved trillion to just do the u.s car fleet it, all of it. And then we, we just said that that's every six to seven years. And so then you have to start to think, okay, well, we got to get recycling for these batteries. And people are talking big about that when you bring that up, but that's not an easy thing. It's expensive. It's energy intensive. It's, there's a lot of chemicals and things involved. And so it's just, it's a complex uh, problem, but I think that people like to try to simplify it. Right. Or we're just going to be electric. No, I love it. I, I heard one recently. It was uh, about New York and getting to the airport. You're going to have electrical helicrafts, kind of hovercraft to turn into planes. Yeah. You know, Marines got them. You know, they use them. They're going to be electric. I love the cruising range of 150 miles. Well, the airport's only, it's not that far, but during the end, not yeah. that far. But they're saying over time, and it was kind of interesting. I, I really was interesting in the technology because it'd be cheaper to run over time. Yeah. And no emissions, zero emissions. So all those Uber drivers right. are going to be off the roads. Right. So 
It's kind of a Jetson thing. It, it, yeah, think yeah. about it, you know. And I'm not discrediscrediting like the I'm not, I, no, I'm not discrediting like the idea. Like I'm just discrediting the like we have to be realistic about yes. the pathway to get yeah. there, right? Oh, there'll be autonomous even. So yeah, you'll oh, be able. 100%. That's coming. It, it, By the so, time I'm a senior citizen, yeah, yeah, I won't and, even worry about and, driving. And, and, and even better, you're not even going to crash right. unless you run out of electricity in the air. And yeah. Then, yeah. I don't know how that works going to work, but I like the thought of it. Yeah. It's not a bad thought. Like it, it needs to be, because to my point, if you want to think about climate, then you have to think about geological time scales, because that's just what climate is, right? But you have to think about, about past, emissions now. But no, no, no. But th- let's break this down into a thought experiment. If you want to think about climate as a topic, you have to think about geological time scales in the past. And sure. then you have to think about geological time scales in the future, sure, right. right? Because climate's a long term thing. Right. And so when we're thinking about these long geological time scales, right. let's 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 let our guard down on things like well, it doesn't make sense today. Well, yeah, things that made sense today didn't make sense 100 years ago and things 100 years from now won't didn't won't make sense today. So that's what I've had to help myself kind of get in that. We're also focused on the, well, I can look at the numbers right now and this technology doesn't make sense. Well, yeah, all technology at first doesn't make money. It takes time to get there. So I think it's an interesting thing looking at the energy transition. I don't know that it will get as far along in my lifetime as people think it will, but I think it's something that is fascinating and fun and a good thought experiment to think about. About, but I'm more thinking about oil and gas and the market cycles because that's where I work today. I'm, I'm looking at a lot of interesting energy transition stuff and investment opportunities. And we'll see if I make the plunge into that at some point. I think it would be cool to do because I think there's a lot of interesting things you can do. But getting back to that topic, you know, oil where it is today, we are, we've had the coronavirus. This has been a crazy, in your lifetime, you haven't even seen it, uh, downturn in demand. I think demand's pent up. Uh, how do you feel about just the where we're at today in terms of like, I mean, I'm going to kind of spoiler it all and say that OPEC uh, has a big uh, hand in whatever is going to happen with the oil prices. But where do you feel about just like where we are today in the oil markets and kind of where are the industries at in terms of cycle seven years in the earlier we touched on in the, in the earlier half of this conversation around inventory and where the U S drillers are at, you know, obviously the lower 48 has been a big swing producer for a lot of this and everybody's been drilling their best stuff now for what, seven years drilling their best stuff. I mean, when did people start saying, Hey, we're going to focus on just the core and not, and we're not going to spend within cash flow. It's been six, seven years and no one's really been acquiring new, locations no one been acquiring new acreage and so there are a lot of smart people that are saying there's not going to be a lot of production growth and people are pent up demand can opec just meet all of that is it just going to get back to this thing where opec controls it all is this era of the shale era kind of over because the u.s is kind of we're out of capital and we haven't made any returns just, just thoughts in general because it's a very loaded question but like no. let's pontificate a little bit sure. about kind of where we're at in the cycle and then what the future the near term and midterm future may hold beyond this this last topic we were just on which is like the far far future yeah, no no no, I I think realistically we're going to see a spike in energy prices. Yeah, I, I can't tell you when, but we're we're somewhere midway through a cycle. Yeah, you know? I, I think the virus obviously with demand kind of threw a wrench in it. We had the Saudi Russia, you yeah. know, uh, spat bad, back bad in, timing bat a year ago in in the spring, and so there was that black swan of bad events, and but. We've already seen production drop. Yeah, rigs, big time. Rigs are down. Infra- Investment flows. Infrastructure capital's down. down. People are down. Yeah. And the Permian's still the Permian. There are people going to like the Permian, okay? Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to ramp back up. It's going to take time. It always does. It right. always lags. Right. And there's going to be growth through people wanting to get out after this pandemic. Yeah. I, I see it. I feel it. I mean, I've traveled this past year. I would probably have traveled more had I felt comfortable without the virus. Yeah. People, once they feel comfortable, they're going to be pent up demand for energy and travel. There is pent up demand. Yeah. And I mean, so, and, and then we're not replacing reserves. Right. Well, we did just the opposite. We've destroyed the infrastructure. We've laid people off. 
right. taking service companies, and we mothballed stuff, put it away. And every time you pull them out, the efficiency is never there. Never, never, never. And you wonder why one crew drills better than the other, because that crew's been out there drilling for years. This crew's just got put together. Right. And it has to be a team. And so when you look at the business in the oil field, it just doesn't happen overnight. It has to have qualified, trained people, and we right. lose that in every cycle sure. downturn. And so it'll lag one more time, and even worse this time because people are afraid to invest in it yeah. because of the narrative. Yeah, yeah, I'll just yeah. leave it at that. Right. So there's money out there, smart money out there, but they're they're just thinking – Wow, this is going Well, they're not going to talk about it to their friends at their cocktail party in New York City. They just won't talk about it, but they'll have their money in it. At some point when commodity prices start to come back, they're not going to brag about it to their buddies. I was in a show in New York City, and and we got to talking with the people next to us. When they found out we were in energy, they moved after the admission. Now, I'm assuming it was just because they didn't believe that it was a good thing to be around maybe Maybe. i mean but like it's just not it's definitely a uh it's definitely a thing where people don't want to investors certainly right now are very much uh energy transition which is fine i think that it it reminds me a lot of the early shale days where people were throwing money at things and like people want to give renewables a hard time about economics well let's talk about shale economics what do people factor in lease costs they factor in gna they factor in. I mean, you want to look at drilling shale wells and you think about the full cycle. No one ever talks about full cycle economics. So I know that renewables, they have some serious issues, but to be fair, oil and gas has had its fair share of issues too. And it comes to investment returns just from that perspective. And it's, uh, you know, investors have always looked at, well, what's that rate of return on a well? Oh, that looks great. Well, what's the rate of return once you paid 25000 sure. an acre? All in. All yeah, in. all in costs and all these things. So it's not, you know, you have to it's, be critical it, to it, yourself yeah. whenever either hasn't had good returns in oil and gas. And part of that is the mm-hmm. cycle of commodities and these issues that we talked about early on. But I do think that uh, a period of higher energy costs, I mean, it just seems like it's inevitable. Well, I mean, it's going to be accelerated, too, because of the events that have happened. Because right. your money just, getting printed. Well, and, and, and then, well, it's just the uh, the overall narrative. That yeah. Go- anytime. How, how do you how do you convince? So, so, no, let's talk enrollment. Yeah. Because everything's lags. Why do populations of students explode? Because like four years ago, they all got in and thought they were going to be an engineer or geologist. Now the business is busting. So you have this population that can't find jobs. So what's happening today? Who's getting into geology and engineering? The, the numbers probably are. And I know these from recruiting over the years. You just wouldn't have more or less applicants because of the cycles where you're at in the cycle. And you're trying to hire. But there had been a downturn in the right, right people. Right. So think about four or five years from now looking for new people. Right. Because people always expire and move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you're going to have a lack of people, yeah. new young people in the field. Certainly. I mean, you're seeing it right it's now. And I right think this now. would be like if you want to look at this conversation is we're about a third, a third, a third. We're in the back third of the second half. And I think that this idea around people that are getting into this business, people that maybe you're in a transition yeah. period right now uh, that maybe got let go from a company or people that are early on in their careers that just got a technical degree in geology or engineering. Uh, Let's talk about those people. I think that's where you're going with it, but that's an interesting topic uh, because it's clearly on a lot of people's minds. Some people may be listening to this. No, I I think, you know, depending on where you're at in your career cycle and in the downturn, you got some hard decisions to make. Yeah. You know, if you're young, you continue. You got to do something to to right. put bread on the money, table. Right. You probably don't have enough savings, so you're going to go work. So don't lose your dream, yeah. but don't give up the day job till you find your dream. Right. And it's hard. And I had to do that at times. Do something else. Get into something else, even though you keep your dream. Then, if you you, you know, obviously, if you're mid career and you're employed versus unemployed, you got to keep your skills up. And and I've always been, and I didn't talk about it. I was involved in the Tulsa Geological Society. Went all the way yeah. up through president. I was involved in the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. I was a delegate and uh, went to regional and and local conventions. And and it was number uh, Kansas. Still am Kansas Geological. Society society and 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 really network to uh, I'm a uh, 
I'm on the board of the Oklahoma Geological Foundation right. and uh, continue to give back and volunteer and network through that and be around uh, other all men, other scientists and, and academics. And it, it keeps you in the game when you're involved in those local societies and, and national societies. And uh, and their, and their uh, enrollment, you can see there how they'll vary with right. the cycles also. Right. But by you participating in that, you're keeping your skills current, you're keeping up with it. And uh, and don't be afraid, like I said, to, to call yourself uh, an independent and do consulting work. Because sure. there's probably some work out there. You just have to find the right person and you have to knock on a lot of doors. And what was my advice to you? Go to lunch. Find yeah. some people. Yeah. Keep that network going. Sure. And it's hard over time. But uh, I found passion. It, I've been passionate about that topic. I've tried to do some mentoring with the OSU uh, kids and students that did. Uh, there's a program, a couple of programs. It's hard. I mean, sometimes it's easy. Like you talk to people and you have right. like they've got a decent path that they've been on. Other times you talk to people and they're on a path where you're like, man, this is a really tough nut to crack on advice that I can give you. And it's one of those things that. I feel like I was really fortunate to have you, uh, to have you and mom to be able to give me good advice around the way to think about career, the way to think about life. I think a lot of people just don't have good uh, anchors and advice in their life to be able to go to and to talk about these things. And so for me, if I, I've often thought about if I wanted to do things to give back, and if I ever you know, was able to do more charity and do things like, I think that's a topic that I enjoy because I think that it's really hard for people to understand, you know, what their options are and what path they can choose. But at the same time, it's also hard to give that advice. And I think that it boils down to just believing in the fact that you can add value to society and to a profession, to whatever skill set that you have, right? You have a skill set, you're focusing on it and you think that, okay, I've learned this thing. I can add value and then not being afraid to put yourself out there and to just take steps to, for betterment. Right. Because I think in, in life for me, and it's not just, even if you've had success, you can get in ruts, right? You can no. get in a rut. No. It's easy. Even when you're in a good job or in a career and you're in a high position, it's easy to get in a rut. You look up one day and you feel like you're in a rut and you're not like, mm -hmm. you're like ah, maybe I'm not really progressing the way I want to progress, whatever it is, if it's your job or if it's in life. And I think that people find themselves early in their career or when they're in these downturns in those ruts. And I think that there are good answers. Sure. And so being able to help people find those answers and think about things in a new light is something that I'm, I'm passionate about. I don't know that I have the answers. Right. It's always not always easy easy i i wish that uh people could realize that there are options and when you're in your career you have different paths you can choose and it's never hopeless right no no, no. I, I i i didn't mention it but i went back and got a master's degree in civil engineering yeah that's the part you skipped over and your skipped whole career over that thing. Yeah. whole career thing at night during all those jobs raising a family yeah i went to school at night for four years got a master's degree from Oklahoma state yeah and it was cool because they told me I couldn't be an engineer. They said I was a geologist. I love that line. Yeah. So I found an advisor who would work with me and I got my uh, engineering degree. But at the end of the day, it's about sometimes going back to school. Sometimes reinventing getting, yourself, reinventing yourself. Don't be afraid to learn something new and have a dual uh, uh, skill set, right. knowing that markets will shift and you could go either way. And I didn't ever do much with that. Uh, but I was so fortunate because it gave me another, uh, it gave me more knowledge that I applied to other things. And so you don't realize sometimes when you go learn something, what you can apply that new skill right. towards. And as fast as things are evolving. And uh, I think education is always valuable. Right. And so if you find yourself at a time where you have time for it, maybe you go pick up another right. skill set. Life's not a straight line. So, and I always say this about networking, it's not a straight line. Like you go to meet with somebody, you think maybe I can get a deal or I can right. get a job offer or something, whatever you're trying to meet with this person. You think this person is somebody that can tie me to something I want. And then it ends up being like that guy's friends, cousin introduces you to somebody that you then get an opportunity from. But it's the same thing with knowledge and skill sets, right? It's not like you learned an engineering degree and, you, and that directly led you to a line of, I got this job because I got this degree. I think that's the thing that people struggle with 
when they're going through school or when they're looking to go back to school and they're always asking you and you're a mentor or trying to give someone advice like well what do i do next what's my next step like now that i have this thing how do i get to this thing that i want and it's life is like this jagged line right it's never like this like straight path uh, and that's, it's hard to explain to someone, but what it is, is, is that you just put yourself in these positions to where the serendipitous, this stuff happens and it connects you eventually to where you want to go. It's a tra- you've mentioned it before. And it's something that I try to live by, which is trajectory, right? It's not necessarily like where the next thing that you hit is. It's just the path. It's the pattern of where you're moving in your career. And I think a lot of people right now in oil and gas are struggling with what's next. Maybe they lost their job or maybe their current company is in a bad spot. But think about the skill sets that you've learned and try to broaden your mindset around all the possibilities of where that can take you and know that it's not going to be necessarily this thing. It may be that thing you're focused on. You straight line, get there. But it oftentimes is something, maybe you're focused on this one thing, but your path Uh, meanders a little bit but you're on the right trajectory because you've set yourself up with the skill set that you've created to get yourself to that place no i I, uh, it's hard because when when you get into these downturns even with the best skill sets you're wondering where do i go next right but trust me there is things to do you can be active right you can be picking up certainly in today's times with various software and things there's always something technology technology something to be learning and honing your skills and uh i know a fellow who's out there a young man he's actually teaching so what did he do here's an example he not only got a consulting gig but he's teaching other people how to be a consultant right putting on an intro class right pretty cool huh yeah that's great he's passing that on you have to Nick i mean Downs, you have to think Nicholas outside Downs. of the box I'll, I'll throw that out there because i give him credit he got lemons and he made lemonade get it right he had something sour happen to him and he turned it right around and in fact even more so where he's being a mentor and helping out other people. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, everybody's not, you know, how life is. <clears throat> everybody's not going to be successful. Right. But if you don't try, you never know. Everybody. So I've had this argument with some people about people say not everyone can be an entrepreneur, uh, which to me. I, I think you can be an entrepreneur, but to be what I would say is financially successful. I should I, successful is, is determined many ways. Just right. getting somewhere. Well, when I think about not everybody can be an entrepreneur, I think about I just break it down to the most basic variable, which is anybody can do anything. <laughs> like I try to not yeah. say anybody can be an entrepreneur. Sure. I just I, th- I yeah. try to think of it along the lines of anybody can do anything. And I don't think that it is necessarily not everyone's going to be a successful entrepreneur if they try to do it. I think anyone can do it. Right. But not necessarily everybody's going to be financially successful with it. But I think at the end of the day, anyone can do anything. Sure. And it's just a matter of uh, doing it the right way, getting the right advice, putting yourself in the right position, duration, right? Persistence. Rate. I mean, however you want to say it, but it's like, it's like doing it for a long enough period of time and and being realistic about it and thinking about things like trajectory rather than near term. Because like sometimes we get so caught up in near like current term goals and near term goals, but you got to think about medium and long term goals. And it's like uh, that's really hard for people to do. Oh, it gets back to this energy transition thing. It's like it's hard to think about 100 years or 50 years, but even in people's lifetime, it's hard to think about one year, sure. five no, years, no, I, I, 30 I think, years. I, I, I used to freak people out, out when I asked them about their five-year plan because right. they just finished four years of school. Yeah. So what was their five-year plan? They just said, I'd say, well, you're on a four, you're, you're almost finished with your five-year plan. See? Right. But the, the truth about what you were getting to in my saying is it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Right. Every road is long. Every road is hard. It's going to be a journey. It's not going to be easy. But look at where you're starting right. and what the potential finish line is and where do you want to be. Yeah. And that longevity, none of us have that in our young scope of life. It's hard to see Very difficult. 20 years down the road when you're 20 years old. It's easier when you're 40. Right. It's easier, it goes even quick. more so when it you're 60, quick. because now you realize how fast the decades are going to go. And if you don't plan the next couple, you're going to run out of decades. Yeah. Even though 10 years seems like a long time. Right. And so for a lot of people, it's a hard that that next step is a hard next step. And you're going to maybe have to do variable things till you find that one thing to the market changes. Sure. And markets will it change. will change markets yeah. will change stay in the market stay in the game yeah 
It's hard in the COVID times because you're not having meetings. Sure. In a Zoom meeting, you can't you go start over. a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's for everybody. You we'll got to start one to figure it out. <laughs> we'll see about that. But no, I mean, it's uh, it's one of those things where I think that the value that maybe this medium the podcast medium can bring or that these discussions can bring is that people that are in that mindset that are thinking about these problems can hear about these uh different ways that you can tackle it and my story uh that some people may know maybe they don't know but the advice that you've given me was there's been times where i'm in these uh was in a funk and was let go from a job or was in a period of my career where i didn't know what i wanted to do and just taking steps forward and making a plan and not worrying about six months from now because you can't worry about six months from now because you got to worry about today and what i got to get done today and what, what's weird what's interesting is that if you get the things you got to get done today and, or, or even just this week look at excuse me, a week at a time and say this week i got to get these things done if you get those things done that week then six months from now will kind of work themselves yeah, out yeah. right no, and so the, the period of like worrying about the six months from now it's, yeah. it's non-productive mm -hmm. because there will be good things or bad things you don't know what's going to happen but if you get the things done today that you got to get done then six months from now it'll probably work itself out so that's been kind of my thing and i try to give people advice to uh put themselves on the trajectory think about the problems you got to solve today this week uh think about what your goals are which is hard not everybody knows what they want to do i mean some sure. it later on in your career you can think about your goals when you're 18 22 25 28 it's hard to know you know what makes a 25 year old happy i don't know what makes a 45 year old happy because right. you're 25 right you know so you, you have to think about these things and then just try to put yourself on the path and not get too caught up in the uh well, I, what's happening to me right now yeah no i i i use the analogy today with gus and uh the analogy was of a gardener. You have to do things continually, even though the season for growing may not be there. Right. You, you, you constantly have to work the earth, the, the garden, and plant things. And you might plant, like, whips of fruit trees, and they're just spindles. No, you're not going to have fruit for five years. Right. But you're going through all this effort because right. you know all this hard work is going to pay off. Vision. You have the vision to know. And, yeah. And, and also the patience yeah. to know that it takes time. In a time where instant gratification. And, and then the weather could be bad. And so even during this period, you're not maybe have the climate that you need, rain, right. sun. But, you know, some are going to make it, some aren't. Yeah. But five, ten years from now, you're going to have fruit. And the hardest part is not having that fruit and doing all the work and getting to that point. And a lot of people, be it in education or a lower level job to work their way up into a better job, it's hard. It, that is, I think that it, we all want that now feeling and in an up market, you get it. Right. And in the down market, you struggle you for don't it, get you it. work for it. You right. work for it. In fact, you may be the best and not get an opportunity. That's right. just the way it is. And it's, it's not fair. Yeah. But if you keep at it, It'll happen. Sure. Sure. Well, that is a very good way to, I think, maybe end it. This is fun. I'm glad we got to do this. And uh, we'll do it again, I'm sure. sure. Hopefully. We'll do it some more. Maybe uh, we'll get on, I don't know, some other medians, and I'll get, force you to come out and talk. I've got a lot of wisdom that I'd like to pry out of you for the public to hear because I think it's been helpful for me. And uh, and it's fun, and I enjoyed it. And I love you because you're my dad, and I'm just happy that we did this, and I appreciate it. You Thank coming you. on. It's been fun. Got to test out the new studio. Yeah, it's a uh, cool setup. It's, uh, it's a work in progress, but... Uh, Nice TV. But it's been fun. Yeah, you gave me that TV. It was free. <laughs> so uh, anyways, all right. Well, this is good. And right. we'll, uh, we'll do it again hopefully soon. Right.